Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. I am forgiven. I am chosen. I am redeemed. I am restored. We are forgiven. We are chosen. We are redeemed. We are restored. I want us to believe that tonight. I asked the worship team to sing that. Thank you guys. What an incredible, that's our song here at Awaken Church from our team. It's amazing, but I couldn't get that out of my head at Easter. You know, that God wants every single one of us to feel like we're forgiven, that he's gonna redeem everything he needs to redeem, that he will restore anything you need for him to restore, and that he chose you. He chose each and every one of you. So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Sounds good? Sounds good. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, thank you for that. Do you guys know it was Pastor Sterling's birthday yesterday? <laughs> yesterday. We asked him to come up here and give a tithe message and he just starts preaching. He can't help himself. I was like, just let him go for the rest of the night. It's gonna be great. But um, Pastor Sterling, we love you so much. We just, we adore you, we love you. You are like the youngest legend of anybody I know. Do you know what I mean? Like usually to be like a legend, you've lived a lot of years and people quote you, but not Pastor Sterling. Like people already quote Pastor Sterling already. You know, exactly. If you hear somebody be like, can I get a yeehaw? You know exactly where it came from. You know, he's famous for his rubber duckies and his Celsius drinks and all of the things, but he's also famous for being a man of God. And I want to tell you, when I looked over at you during worship, so I guess I'm just going to cry all night. I don't know what this is. It's just the Holy Spirit. Just ignore me. It'll be fine. But um, I looked over at you during worship tonight, and God gave me a word for you. He said, promotion. And I said, well, yeah, God, like he got a work promotion this past year. You're obviously going to get in the best promotion you could get with being a father this year. But God said, no, there's more to it than that. You're going to continue to get promotions in the workplace. But God said, these are supernatural, personal promotions. It's like you're, you live in this huge house. It's like your life is this huge mansion. And you're going down a hallway, and there's doors all over. And they're all part of your life. And some of those doors you've never opened just because you didn't know they were there or, or it just wasn't time. But this year, God's going to give you the keys to unlock some of those doors. And you're going to unlock those doors and there's going to be no fear there. There's going to be no hesitation there because behind those doors is more provision. Behind those doors is people that you need in your life. Behind those doors is more provision, things that are going to bring you joy and laughter. So stretch your hands out towards Pastor Sterling. We just thank you, God, for this life. We thank you, God, for this coming year for him, Lord. I thank you, God, for the keys to unlock everything that he's going to need in this next life. I thank you, Lord, that being a father is not only going to be his greatest joy, but all the things that you're going to do in him and through him in this next year. We thank you and we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. Well, you guys can take a seat. It is an honor and a privilege to be up here with you today. You know, I was thinking about, um, is Dom here or is she in there with youth? In high school. Okay. Tell her to come find me later. I have something I have to tell her. Yeah. I saw her. She was standing right over here during worship, right? Yeah. Oh, I love her. Okay. Um, but you know how you watch those movies and you have like, you used to watch cartoons when you were little and there was like an angel on one shoulder and there was like a devil on the other. And like you're a kid, so you don't realize how real that is until you get to be an adult and you think, 
whoa, like that was the most accurate thing ever. Like on one hand, we have this powerful almighty God who created the universe and created us. And he sacrificed himself as we just celebrated an Easter for each one of us. And he wants to be our heavenly father. He wants to give us gifts. He wants us to lead a blessed life. And then on the other shoulder, we have the devil. And I'm not talking about like Christian Waples devil that we all know and love that's about to go on stage at Hero at San Marcos. I'm talking about like the real life author of like death and destruction and, and he, you know, he's like your worst enemy. Like he wants to destroy your life and, and take everything away from you. And common sense would tell us that we need to do everything we can to avoid someone with those kind of intentions, right? However, sometimes I think we find ourselves in life with circumstances where we've let the enemy, not, on, not really on purpose, but we've let the enemy come in and kind of twist things and tarnish things and maybe even destroy an area of our life that God wants us to be flourishing in. So tonight together, we're going to do it together. Let's see if we can identify some of the areas where maybe we have believed some of those lies in the enemy, of, the, of the enemy, where the devil's come in to twist something that God wants to be beautiful, that God brought to be a strength in your life. Because the word of God is that we are forgiven, we are chosen, we are redeemed, we are restored, and we need to make sure that our lives line up with the word of God, right? So we can protect our lives and our mind and our marriages and our, our children and our finances and our businesses and our community, amen? Amen. amen. Well, here I am somehow on this incredible stage that was built by our pastors. If I have not met you yet, my name is Pastor Tessa. My husband Charles and I have the privilege and the honor of serving and leading here under our incredible regional pastors, Pastor John and Pastor Becky. We would not be who we are without them, without their leadership, without their example, without um, their discipleship in our life. And of course, all of our transformation and the eight campuses and more that are coming here at Awaken Church are because of our lead pastors, Pastor Jurgen and Pastor Leanne. As Pastor Marissa has so eloquently said, uh, Pastor Jurgen, I mean, they're really just San Diego's pastors. Really, they're California's pastors. Really, they're the United States pastors. I mean, people all over the world are watching what this movement is doing. You know, I love that we, like, I just, like, tears to my eyes when I see, like, the Salvations and Kids Church on Easter, you guys. Hundreds of kids. Like, almost 15,000 people walk through the doors of Awakened Church. That is amazing. Amazing. Rukowskis, it's so good to see you. Welcome back. How was the Boise opening? Was it amazing? Amazing. Amazing. We can't even help it. We're, like, opening in states all over the place. We can't help it. And now we're going into Hero. We're going into Hero. So you heard all about Hero. The Piles did an incredible job. Buy your tickets. You can go with them tomorrow night and get really good seats. That is still a really good night. But here we are coming out of Easter and going into Hero. And do you know Hero usually has more salvations than Easter does? Like, incredible, incredible, incredible. So if you don't have your tickets, get them. You will sit there and sing and rock out the whole time. You're not going to feel like you're in a church. So invite all the people that you know in your world, in your life, in your neighborhood, in your workplace that wouldn't go to church with you. Invite them to Hero. They will be pumped about it. Really, really pumped. So um, sometimes I laugh that I'm up here in front of you all with a microphone and um, on this stage that our incredible pastors built I am, for the most part, fairly confident. I know what I like, what I don't like, probably more than my husband would prefer. <laughs> but um, I'm almost, well, no, I am 47 years old, which I can hardly believe. Um, and I'm getting to that age where people say, like, you start not really caring what anybody thinks, which sounds really fun and, like, really freeing. So I'm looking forward to that. But um, I am still working out things with God. And I, I know he's still working out some things within me. And um, it's like, I, you know, we look at all these incredible people and all of our pastors and thank God they're so real with us because we look at them and we think like, oh, that's just how they are. Like, um, they must needed to, to not have to grow as much as I've had to grow. And how many of you know, it's not how you start the race, it's how you finish the race, right? 
So sometimes we forget, or at least I do, when we see something that we like that, you know, we just think, well, that's how they are. Well, usually um, a lot of work went into that. And usually there's a battle behind of it, some of it. See, in the Bible, God saw David as a king, but he had to kill some giants first. He didn't become king overnight. He had to kill some lions and some bears. I was asking Charles on the way here. He killed lions and bears, right? And he was like, yeah, I think so. So if that's not 100% accurate, you can let me know later. But he had to take down some giants in his own life first, right? He was rejected by his family. He was a wanted man. Um, you know, he might be an extreme case in the Bible, but there's examples all the way through the Bible about how God uses our hard times to create who we are now. See, John 16, and this is the Amplified Version, so you'll see why I like it so much. It says, in me, you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world, you will have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration, but be of good cheer. Take courage. Be confident, certain, undaunted that I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you, and I have conquered it for you. I have deprived it of power to harm you. It can't harm you because God's going to stand in front of it. Isaiah 41.10 says, fear not, there is nothing to fear, for I am with you. Do not look around you and tear and dismay. In terror, oh, okay, so spell check. In terror and dismay, for I am your God. I will strengthen and harden you to difficulties. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will hold you up. I will retain you with my victorious right hand of righteousness and justice. So we can be encouraged today. He is the author and the finisher. So if it doesn't look good yet, then guess what? We get to partner with God because he's not finished yet if it doesn't look good. And I encourage myself with these words all the time. So I'm just here to encourage you with them today. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. God can use everything you've been through for a purpose. See, I was always the new kid in school. Well, not always, but we moved a lot. And every time we moved, it meant that now I got to find new friends. Um, the school that my kids are in now have this program where if you're new, they'll like partner you with somebody and then you get to shadow them all day. And I'm like, that is brilliant. So now you're not like new and trying to figure out where to go. You immediately have friends, but they did not have that when I was growing up. And because I moved a lot, I've realized later in life that I developed a need for people to like me. When I, when, you know, it's like when you're younger, the moves are like super fun. You know, you get a new house, you get a new room. It's like an adventure. But as you get older, change, it's not always so fun. And it means you leave your friends and you have to make new ones. And um, mom and dad, do not squirm, okay? Because shout out to you guys. You truly gave me the most incredible life. I am so grateful for all the changes and the experiences that I had And I know that some things you don't truly understand until you're an adult. Thank you. (laughs) So here I am at 16 years old, pretty absorbed. Most 16 year olds, you know, as great as they are, pretty absorbed into their own world. And right around 16 year old, uh, right around being that age, I got to move. It was the hardest move. It was the middle of my junior year. And at that time, we lived in this beautiful neighborhood in Orange County. And I had great friends. And I had a boyfriend. And my parents liked him. So it was all good. And we got to, (laughs) well, who set these people in the front row? I mean, seriously. And, uh, you know, I just thought I was living like the teenage dream, you know, like you, we've got to go to the beach and we just thought we were so cool. And, um, and, and I had just, I think tried out for like the cheer teams. I was pumped about that. And so next year was going to be like so good. And then we moved and I found out we were moving from California where we were at to Arizona, nothing against Arizona. If you're watching from Arizona, I actually love Arizona. You have the most beautiful sunsets and I love the dry weather cause it makes my hair and my skin way better. So that's good. Shout out to Arizona for those things. But at that time, I was not thinking about those things. And I knew this movement, all new friends. 
And it was just one state away, but California and Arizona have a very, very, very different culture. So we moved there, school's already started, and I'm the new girl. I'm the California girl. Like, most of the girls there were still perming their hair or had, like, super curly hair at the time. And I, like, show up with this long blonde hair and different style of clothes. And how many of you all know that stuff matters in high school? You know, your hair, your clothes, your, your shoes, that stuff matters. It's like everything. And um, so, so here I am at this age trying to figure out, you know, who you are and what you like and what you want to be. Like, I don't know why people ask kids in high school. Most people don't know what they want to be. And, and, uh, and if you don't, that's okay. They'll figure it out, you know. But I felt sometimes like my life was like a movie, you know, where you like, you, you see this kid like walking into a lunchroom and they're looking around and they're thinking like, oh my gosh, like I'm holding a tray or I'm holding my lunch and you're like, I don't, I don't really know where to sit. Like, I kind of want to be friends with them. So... Maybe if I go over there, what, what am I going to say, you know? Or, or I kind of want to be friends with them, but if I go over there, like, I wonder if I have to play whatever sport th they play, and that wasn't my thing. And, um, and I would, like, look over there, and I'd think, like, oh, I, 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 don't know, I wonder if I sit over there, how am I going to talk? And do I need to dress a certain way to be with them? And I do, do I need to act a certain way to be with them? And all you thought about was like, what do I need to change about me to fit in here, to be accepted here? Because so far at this new school, like I felt different. I was different. I wasn't quite fitting in yet. And my dad, who was and is still into classic cars, um, had partnered with me and put me into a convertible 1969 Plymouth Valiant. I wish I still had that car, okay? It was it was amazing. However, at that time in my life, I did not appreciate this car, okay? I did not appreciate that it had an AM radio only, and I did not appreciate that it looked very, very different from everybody else's car, right? Because in high school, you just kind of want to fit in and look like everybody else. So the people in this school started calling me California Barbie, and then they started calling my car the Barbie classic car. And it became a really positive nickname, but the girls that gave it to me first were not trying to be nice when they gave me this nickname. They decided that the new girl was not going to be welcomed and was not going to be included. And let me just tell you something I've learned as I've gotten older. If people treat you like that, it usually has more to do with them than it has to do with you, right? <laughs> There was one girl, Joey, she talked to me because she wanted to ride home. Um, and we did end up becoming friends eventually, but nobody welcomed me. They were not all mean. They were just like too absorbed in their own life. You know what I mean? No one had taught them to look around and notice if someone was being left out. And there was, though, there's definitely a group of girls that made sure they knew I was not welcome and I was not going to be accepted. They made it kind of miserable for me. For a while, I had hated going to school because it was just like rejection every day. I remember hiding in the bathroom at lunch, calling my parents and saying, can you just pick me up like, and just take me home or come get me and take me to lunch because I just didn't want to sit by myself another day at lunch. And my mom, who's an incredible role model, had always said, babe, just kill him with kindness. If somebody is mean to you, you just kill him with kindness, which is a, you know, an incredible way of just saying, turn the other cheek. But no matter how nice I was to them, they were not reciprocating it. They did whatever they could to leave me out to make sure that I knew there was a party happening, but I was not invited. I remember this one day I was getting into the Barbie classic car, and um, um, like a third, if I left the top down on that car, like a third of the football team would be like sitting in the car because the guys loved that car. And so I came out one day and they were just sitting in it. It was full and I was um, shooing them out of the car because I ended up becoming friends with some of the guys because they were actually nice to me and they were fun, but that did not help my, yes, that did not help at all my status with the girls for sure because some of them were dating them and I was like, I don't want your stupid boyfriend, okay? I just want you to be normal normal. And um, one of these mean girls owned like a black Jeep, which was like the coolest car in high school, right? And there was like 10 of them and they were all in the Jeep and it was like a Friday and they were all going somewhere that I wasn't included. And they saw me over there 
shooing like some of the kids out of my car and they made sure they went the long way and they came around and they barked at me and yelled that I was a dog or looked like a dog or something like that in front of everybody. And I just like, it just felt awful, right? It just was, it was mean. And I remember I went home and I was like, you need to let me move back to California. I can live with my friends. I have people that'll take me in. Like, I don't want to be here any longer. They were smart enough to want to keep our family intact, which was a good decision. So they said no, that I was going to have to make the best of it and then I could do this. I was going to figure out how to be okay with not being liked, not being included, not being accepted. My parents had also taught me and modeled for me to never get up, never give up, to keep my head high. Eventually, things would always get better. So I did my best. I did make another friend. Her name was Tanya. She was super popular. She was friends with some of those mean girls. So that helped me out a little bit. And um, she started including me in things. And my mom started encouraging me to be the one that invited people to do things. So we would have like super fun lunches. And she would make this huge meal. And we would get in our cars and race over to the rental house we were living in because they were building a house. And we'd like eat this incredible lunch that, that she would make us, and we'd jump in the cars, and we'd rush back to school, and we were laughing, and we thought it was like the funnest thing. And I always invited those mean girls to join me, always, but they never did. That's okay, they missed out. Eventually, enough people must have liked me because I shockingly got voted homecoming queen. I was like shocked. Wow, thank you, everybody. Um, I was super excited. I was like, they finally like me. Like, I'm accepted. However, one of those mean girls that barked at me, it was the girl that owned the Jeep. She was like the, yeah, she was the, you remember these stories, huh, mom? She was like the student body president. And so she was in the room when they were counting votes, and she started realizing that I was getting a lot of votes, and then I started getting more votes than she was getting. So she went in later and changed the votes. And it was like this whole school scandal, and everyone started congratulating me, and then it turned out it wasn't me, and she got in trouble, because, you know, what you sow, you reap, eventually. But um, it just had kind of felt like rejection all over again, you know, because it was embarrassing. Like, everybody knew that that had happened. And so I had to decide in that moment, in all the moments in those, in those times, am I the girl that people can't like because I have no value? Am I the girl that's going to let these girls who don't know me and are not trying to get to know me tell me who I am or where I belong or what I am? It's... It's as if, like, if I was going to allow what those girls thought I was to be, was I rejected, was I unlovable, did I not belong, or was I who God said I was? Thank God I was a Christian. I was going to church. I had an incredible family that had posited value and life and love into me, but I still had to choose what to believe. Eventually, I did enjoy, I made it. I made it through those, that year and a half left of high school, and I thrived in it. But just like anything you go through that's hard, it grows you, right? It strengthens you. It gave me eyes for new people, that's for sure. God turned it around for good. He always does. Like, you, my girls are shaking their head because they're, they know I'm like, don't you ever, ever, ever let anybody sit by themselves. I don't care if you think they're weird. I don't care if they don't fit in. You include them. Eventually, they'll find their people, and, and they don't have to be your best friend, but don't ever, ever let anybody sit by themselves. But going through that experience in high school, I realized years later that that had sort of put me on this, like, performance, people-pleasing route in me. And I had to work on that. I would go into a new situation, and all of a sudden I'd be, like, super insecure, which wasn't normal. And a thought would cross my mind, like, you're not going to be accepted here. Or whatever... You, you think you are to be accepted here, you're not. Like, I would sometimes have this thought that would cross into my mind, like, you need to be whatever it is, like your boss or your friends or your coworkers or whoever the people are in here. You, you need to be whatever they want you to be so you can be accepted here and included. 
See, that was the devil trying to lie to me and tell me that I couldn't just be my fabulous self because then if I did, then the others wouldn't like me and I wouldn't belong. Clearly, I have worked through that, okay? I wear all the sparkly things normally. I am usually a fabulous, fun, completely embarrassed my children self. But it was in those moments when I was still figuring it out, when I wanted to be accepted, it really, really, really mattered what I told myself, what I thought I was, what thought I was allowing to come into my head. See, you may not be able to control the first thought that pops into your head, but you can control whether you agree with it, whether you let it stay there, and whether you meditate on it. That is why the Bible reminds us to take every thought captive. And, and you know what else it says after that? It says to make it obedient to Christ. So that means when our thoughts come into our mind, we need to line them up with what the word of God says. Was I agreeing with, with the idea of being unlovable? Why was I giving them so much power about where I belonged? See, it matters what belief system we come into agreement with, right? It matters whether whether we listen to that devil or whether we listen to that angel, right? So here we were, right after Pastor Sterling's beautiful tithe message, and we sang, I am chosen. I am chosen. We are chosen. You are chosen. See, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2.9, you are not an accident. You were chosen to live here in this moment, in this time, to make a difference. It is not an accident that you walked into the doors of Awakened Church here at Balboa Campus tonight. It is not an accident that you're sitting in your seat. It is not an accident. You're meant to be here. You're meant to be here. And gosh, thank God it is never more true today that we were meant to be here at this time in this place, in in the United States, in California, to fight for what is right, right? I mean, we need to shed light on evil. We need to expose truth. We need to, to glorify God in all that we do. But we need to remind ourselves every day that we are sons and daughters of the Most High King, that we are created in His image. So I would encourage you to do what I did. Years ago, I started doing this before I completely believed it. And you know what? There's sometimes when I wake up and I don't believe it, but we are not controlled by our emotions, you guys. We are controlled by what we say. If you don't feel like doing something, just do it. The emotions will follow. If you decide to start living your life based on what, how you feel, oh my gosh, I would never get out of bed in the morning, you know? I would eat whatever I wanted. Then I would feel terrible, so then I would really do nothing. So I started declaring God's word loud over my life first thing in the morning. I would write this on my mirrors, and I still would declare things like, God will supernaturally open doors for me. You want something to shift and change in your life? Start declaring that God will supernaturally open doors for you. I would declare favor and blessing will follow me all the days of my life, and they do. I have favor. I have blessing. I have parking favor. I have line favor. I have favor with people. I have things I'm able to return that I'm not able to return. I've been claiming that over my life and it works. I claim now, especially over my children as I'm starting to get drivers, nothing by any means shall harm us. Nothing by any means shall harm us. No weapon formed against us will prosper. Start claiming these things over your life. It doesn't matter if you believe it yet. Start claiming it. They're promises that God gave you because you were chosen. You were chosen. You are loved. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. So we just sang that. We just sang, I am forgiven. I am chosen. I am redeemed. I am restored. You know, it's so great to be in worship and sing that. It's powerful to sing that. But I want us to believe it. Like no matter what you've done or what's been done to you, you're forgiven. That's why we just celebrated Easter. That's what we just celebrated on Easter. That God traded himself for you. So that no matter what you've done, he's already paid for it. He's already paid for it, so you don't have to. So if you're here today and you're carrying shame over things that you've done or things that have been done to you, that's not from God. That's not from God. You can leave that right here at the altar tonight. God can make all things new. If you're here tonight and you realize that there's some area in your life where you've let other people or circumstances try to define you or try to tell you that you're not accepted or you're not belong, God will redeem that tonight. 
If you're sitting in here and you're thinking, I don't know if I belong in here. I don't know if I'll be accepted. That's a lie. You're accepted. You were already chosen. It's not an accident that you walked in here. Come down here tonight and we'll pray for you. And you can leave that feeling here. I know that some of you have lived a life where you should have been chosen. But you weren't. Where you should have been loved more by a parent. But you weren't. Where you should have been more cherished by a spouse. But you weren't. No matter who chose you or didn't choose you here in life, God chose you. He created you. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every thought that you have, every decision you're going to make. But even more importantly, he knows all the hopes and the dreams and the plans and the purposes he has for you. I mean, he knew that the Max one day would walk into my house for Connect Group that they would be so teachable and so beautiful and that, and that they would have like a mantle on their life for business and influence. That's what you guys carry, a mantle on your life for business. And because of that, you become territory takers. And because of that, you've allowed other people to become territory takers. And God is saying he's just getting started. He is just getting started. You've been putting systems into place lately and he's saying, that's exactly what I want you to do. Keep the systems in place and keep working hard, but I'm taking you to another level. And it's not going to take more strife, and it's not going to take more hard work. It's not even going to take a lot more people because there's such favor on you. And what you've done, you've done with such integrity and with such the right heart that he's going to elevate you because he can trust you. Thank you for being those kind of people. Thank you for the tissues. I didn't know I was going to have a runny nose in front of all of you. That's super fun. I don't know why I always cry when it's Holy Spirit. It's so good. How many people love the Thousands? So much love for you guys. I feel like God wants you. Okay, I'm totally going to cry for this one. To not give up. Don't give up on what you know your family and your future is supposed to look like. There are delays, but it's not delays because it's stuff you've done. It's delays on the other side. It's delays because there's an anointing on your children. Like there's just something special and all three of them, very different. And he's, he needs to get things ready because it's like Pastor Morgan so beautifully said, God's never late. So I know this has felt like a delay. I know it's been painful. I know you don't understand what is holding things up, but God is never late. So just keep, keep your feet planted, holding hands, believing for what is coming, because it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. And it'll be just the right thing at just the right time. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be absolutely amazing. It's going to be amazing. Um, I don't know your name, but you have the Emerge hat on, third row. Stone, what a cool name. I know you're not new. I just don't know if I've ever had a conversation with you, Stone. And God keeps highlighting you to me. So I know he wants to tell you that. There's something about you, Stone, like you have um, two sides to you. You have this really gentle side to you, um, but, but you have a real, uh, like a strength to you. So it's not a strong side, but it is a strength. It is absolutely a strength. And God gave you both of those things because you need them. You need them for not only what you're doing now, but what you're going to do. I don't know what you do, but I think he's been kind of prompting you in a certain direction and God is saying that you can trust him to go in that direction that he's already given you everything he's already given you the gentleness on one side but that gentleness is not a weakness it's endearing so it means people are going to be able to trust you when they need to and then the strength 
is because you're whatever it is you're going to be called to do you're not doing it by yourself and you're going to there's going to be people that come alongside you that you haven't even had to like recruit and bring God's just going to bring them and that strength is going to carry you through it's going to help not just you but all the people around you so keep doing that stone it's nice to meet you officially I'm excited to see what God is going to do it's going to be really really good so I don't know all of your stories but God does he knows all of them and I want to remind you tonight that you are forgiven you are chosen you are redeemed, you are restored, and you are loved. There's some of you in here that need to know that you're loved, that you're loved. Do you know what the definition of redeemed is? It's to get back or win. It's to be able to escape from what distresses or harms you. It's to overcome something, to release debt or blame. How amazing is that? See, if you will look closely, God will redeem so many things. He already has. He's already redeemed so many things in your life if you look. And he, he will continue to do so because he's a good father. But that time in high school when I was lonely and doubting myself and not accepted, God has completely redeemed that for me. I have beautiful, deep, meaningful, fun, beautiful friendships now. And out of that insecure time, I learned who I was I learned to go to God for affirmation and not man. I've learned that God is the, the, the fulfillment of all my joy and my security. That confidence doesn't come because I buy the right clothes or I hang out with the right people or because I'm accepted. That confidence comes because I remind myself every day that God has plans for me better than I can think or ask or imagine. That God has plans for every one of you that, can, that you can think or ask or imagine. God can and will redeem the moments in your life. The things that should have been awesome that weren't, he will redeem those. He will redeem the hurt. He will redeem the pain. What do you need God to redeem for you today? You know, we're in this series called Back to Life. What has God been speaking to you about? What needs to be brought back to life? What are the dreams that you've given up on? Because you think, the time's passed. I missed that opportunity. I'm too old. Those are lies. Those are lies. There's still time. Somebody needs to hear that. There is still time. It's not gone. It's just sitting over there waiting for you. He's, he's just waiting for you to get off the pity party, dust yourself off, walk back over to it. It's like Pastor Morgan says, God's always on time. There was a, a while that the devil was whispering to me that I was going to need to give up on my dream of ever having a house or two or three or you know, some of the dreams that I have. I remember it was Vision Sunday. It was like two years ago. And I was like, oh, I can't even fill out this vision card. I put it in my Bible. I waited a week. And it was two weeks. And then I just started feeling guilty. So I was like, okay, I'm going to sit here and pull it out and have a moment with you, God. And here's what's so beautiful about God. He knew I was frustrated. He knew I was disappointed. So I told him all those things. And he said, that's okay. I know. Guess what? I'm going to restore hope in you. It's okay. Write it down anyway. Write it down anyway. No matter how I felt in that time, I just kept walking through the doors of this church because I knew that my faith would get renewed in here. I knew that if I sat in here and worshiped, that hope would rise up inside of me. You can't be worshiping God and praying and singing all the things we were praying and then complain at the same time. That's what's so beautiful about doing it. So we need to choose our words carefully. God wants to bless every aspect of our life. He is the God of restoration. What has been lost will be restored. If there's something in your life that's been lost, it's going to be restored. Let's all stand up. Let's stand up. Thank you, man, for joining me. I want you guys to just close your eyes because I know that I just told a silly story about high school, but I realized it was the root of where I started 
having some thoughts that didn't line up with the word of God. So I want you to ask yourself today, what do I need to be restored? What needs to be redeemed in me? Is it confidence? Is it hope? What do you need to be believing for again? I just want God to work on your heart. It's big things, it's little things. He's gonna show you, he always does, he's so faithful. He's gonna show you all the things you've been hoping for, believing for, praying for, they're coming. God's not late. He is the restorer of all things. So with your eyes closed, I want you to raise your hands. If like me, there's times where you felt like you didn't belong or you felt like you were rejected, not by your own, not by what you did, or even if it was something you did, that's not God's design for you. Rejection is not your portion. Keep your hands raised, we're gonna pray. If there's something else around, if there's, hold on, there's one more thing I wanna pray for. I believe there are people here with a, a business idea or, a, or a, um, something that God's been prompting them to do. Whether it's something on the side, whether it's stepping out and doing something in addition to what you're already doing, but there's an idea that you have and you don't know how it's all gonna line up so you haven't done it yet. I want you to raise your hand because I want God to start coming around and he is going to give you, he's, it's like, it's like I see a puzzle and you haven't, you haven't put it together because you don't know how all the puzzle pieces go together. But God says, that's okay. The reason why you haven't done it yet is because I want you to partner with me and do it. I have the, the box with the picture of what it's supposed to look like. So when you just partner with me, when you just reach out to me, I am going to join you and I am going to help you put that puzzle piece together because I know what the end picture is supposed to look like. So I just thank you, God, for visions. I thank you, God, for dreams. I thank you, God, that hope is rising today. I speak to you fear, and I cancel you right now in the name of Jesus. I say that you are no longer allowed to occupy the minds or the futures of these people. I thank you, God, that, that we rebuke the, the thought that it is too late. It is never too late. God has plans and purposes for you. He knows the desires of your heart. He has everything ready for you just on the other side side of saying yes. Say yes to God today. It is coming. It is coming. Beachlers, not only will you guys have multiple properties, but this, I don't know if this is something you've been dreaming about, but I see a farm. There's like a farm and there's children running all over this farm. And the farm is going to help you with business. And the farm is going to provide not only just like joy and happiness for you guys, but for anybody that, that somehow it's gonna be tied into business and you're gonna have your land and your business multiplied, but your time is gonna be multiplied. Meaning that, that there's gonna be more that you're putting your hand to, but you're gonna feel more free than you've ever felt. Either God's gonna bring people around to do it, you're not gonna have to do as much, or it's just gonna be lighter, a little bit of both. So just. I thank you, God, for that word for them. I'm excited to see that beautiful farm and all of those children running around. It's going to be so good. Is Telly still in here or no? Did he go out with a baby? I I'm, I'm want to pray for him later. Okay, one more. Do we have time? How many people love the Moriartys? I mean... I have so much love for you. If I didn't have such amazing parents, I would ask you guys to adopt me, which I think is what most people here would say because you have already adopted so many people. But I think what God is showing me about you is that you are, you're just, you're pillars. You're pillars. And uh, what's so great about pillars is they hold up things. You need, you need, the reason why you can be pillars is because you've built your foundation so strong. You've built your foundation on God. You've built your foundation on family. And so you guys are now 
this new era of your life where you're pillars and you're holding up something so strong and something so beautiful. And because of that, you know what else pillars provide? They provide covering. They provide covering and you guys have provided covering for so many people and for so many people that don't have families. But, but God is saying that I'm gonna multiply what you've already put your hand to. You guys have sowed so many seeds, whether it's, it's um, professionally, whether it's um, just loving on people that need, whether it's an encouraging word, whether it's serving in the house of God, God is saying it is now time to multiply you. I know you think you're already living your dreams, but just wait. Just wait till you see what I'm about to do. You're going to continue to put your hand to things because that's how you are because you're pillars. But God is going to make your your pillars even strong. He's going to multiply them. It's kind of like I just see this whole column. Like if you've been to Balboa Park and there's like in the Oregon Pavilion, there's just pillar after pillar after pillar after pillar. You guys are going to multiply after who you are. You're already pastors at heart. You're already parents at heart. You've already built this incredible foundation. You've already provided covering over things. But because you have done all of that, God says, I'm going to 10x all the things that you have put your hand to, all the things that you have put your hand to, all the things you've been hoping and believing for and dreaming for, I'm going to 10x it. I'm going to make you stronger, more beautiful, bigger than you've ever dreamed. Thank you for that. Thank you guys. I love you so much. Okay, I'm over time, and I know they're going to tell me to tell you to get your kids out of kids' church, which I think is the funniest thing to say because I don't think most of you on purpose, of course, it depends on the day, would leave your kids in kids' church. But um, um, I want to make sure that if you need to stay um, in this atmosphere, you can. We're going to have our ministry team come up, and if there's things that God has... um, identified that he wants you to work through, that he wants you to leave at this altar today. I I want you to do that. If you just want someone to partner with you to just like, just confirm some of the things we prayed for today, come on up and do that. And if you've never accepted Christ Jesus into your heart, so you don't understand what it was that we celebrated for Easter, I want to make sure that you do that tonight and you don't leave here the same. Right over here is a response lounge. We have beautiful people in there waiting for you. So please stop by there if you want some prayer, if you want to accept Jesus. If you've never done that, we have a Bible, we have a book for you. But I love you, church. Thank you for listening to my story. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, hey, listen, for more information about it, about it go to www.awakenchurch.org or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't, if you haven't, and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you having us today. We forward to seeing you and you again. God bless you. Live a life that is, that is formative. Bye for now.